What's up guys and welcome back to Monique. If you guys are new here then what is up? My name is Erica. Hey, how you doing? If you're into the history of the ancient Greeks and the Romans, maybe you're just into the mythology and maybe, maybe you are just here because you want to see Odysseus finally string the bow. Well then this is not only the video for you, this is also the channel for you. You guys are going to want to hit that subscribe button and the bell icon so you know every single time I post in the future. But on topic of today's video and as you can see from the title we're going to be going into book 21 of Homer's Odyssey. If I could summarize book 21 into a one sentence it would just be that the suitors compete for Penelope and Odysseus tells Eumaeus who he is. Yep, that's pretty much the most important thing that happens in this book. Obviously, Odysseus does string the bow. We know that this is going to happen. This is something that has been prophesized the entire book. And this is now the big moment. So in saying that, why don't we just roll into the narrative? So the book opens with Athena inspiring Penelope to finally get this whole contest rolling, right? Because that is the moment that we have all been waiting for. It is the moment that the suitors have been waiting for. It is the moment that Odysseus in disguise has been waiting for. Like, this is now the time to shine. So Penelope goes upstairs to this vault, basically. They have this, like, vault with all these treasures and everything. She goes upstairs, she puts the key in the lock, goes inside, and she picks up this bow that was Odysseus's. And it was like his prized possession, you guys. It was given to him by one of his like very close friends. He never left the island with it. Like even before the Trojan War, this man literally only took it out on Ithaca to go hunting, where he would like literally never even put it down because he was too scared to do that because this bow meant so much to him. So Penelope now picks up this bow and she has a moment where she like leans on her leg. She takes a seat, leans on her leg. And she just starts crying because she misses her husband so much and she kind of knows that this is now the moment where she has to give up that fantasy that he's gonna come home so she takes a moment to herself we got to give it to her and then you know she sort of gets her together and she goes downstairs she has all of her maidens take all of these treasures from the storeroom as well the vault even and they go down to the hall in order to stand in the center as they normally do and penelope like demands attention from the suitors she's like hello i am ready to speak she makes a massive announcement in this moment where she basically says to all of them okay since you all have made yourselves comfortable you all want to win my hand in marriage now is the time to shine okay now is your day to do that here's what i propose here's a bow look at it it's really pretty this is odysseus's bow you guys have to string the bow and then you will have to fire the bow through 12 axes cleanly okay that is what she instructs them to do and she says whoever can do that she's gonna marry but they have to do both parts that's key they can't just string the bow and then not fire it through the axes they have to do both things. So the first man who can do that, that's her new husband. She then also points to all of the treasures that the women are holding and she's like, this will all be yours if you become my husband and you manage to do this task. So all of the suitors, super keen. Penelope then instructs Eumaeus to actually set up all of these axes right in the room. And he ropes in the cowherd to do that. But as they're doing it and as they're looking at Penelope holding this bow, they actually start crying themselves because they too are realizing that the day has come where they have to have a new king and they've got to give up the fantasy that Odysseus is coming home. Obviously not knowing that he's literally sitting in the room, but like minus that. They're bawling their eyes out in this moment. And that triggers Antinous to stand up because remember, he always feels like he has to talk. So Antinous stands up and he has this very long speech, but I'm not gonna say the whole thing to you guys, but basically what he says is that they should not be crying because Penelope's already upset, which actually I agree with him in. He says to the swineherd and the cowherd, you both shouldn't be crying because Penelope is already grieving for her husband. This is already very difficult for her. So you shouldn't also be encouraging her grief. If you guys feel the need to cry, go stand outside. Or if you just want to calm down, then you can sit at the table. You can have something to eat, have something to drink and then resume your duties. But either way, cut it the f out, which again, I actually agree with him in this moment. He doesn't say it as rude as I just said it. I won't lie. He says it a little bit more politely because he's trying to impress Penelope in this moment. Uh, but either way, Homer does tell us right now that even though he's a smooth talker, that he, Antinous, will be the first suitor to be hit by Odysseus' arrow when the time comes for him to slaughter all of the suitors, right? So we know now that Antinous will be the first one to die, which is amazing. The two herders do actually continue to get everything ready though. They kind of pull themselves together. And it's Telemachus who stands up in response to Antinous and kind of laughs at him, but also brushes him off, where he then addresses all of the suitors to say, my mother is like the most beautiful woman in Greece, pretty much at this point. There's nobody who rivals her in Pelos, in Mycenae, no matter what, it's like she is top tier kind of woman. And so because of that, he actually wants to compete first. He wants to see if he can string the bow first, because he says, if he can do that, then he doesn't have to worry about what household she's gonna go to. He doesn't have to worry about who she's gonna marry and all that sort of stuff. Because if he wins, then all of them can f right off and he's just gonna inherit everything in the palace and his mother is gonna stay there. Which is such a princely move and I'm such a fan of him right now. It's just unfortunate that he fails, right? So he stands up to try and string the bow, tries three times, fails three times. On the fourth time, Odysseus in disguise actually comes over to him and basically taps him on the shoulder and is just like, just 
Give it up. This is not what you're gonna do. And it's because it's really, really hard to string this bow. That is the whole point of the task. Penelope has basically set them an impossible task that only Odysseus or somebody who has his strength can do. Not even his son can do it. I mean, come on. So Telemachus has this moment where he kind of throws a bit of a temper tantrum and he throws it while well, he doesn't throw. He puts the bow lightly down on the ground and he just says, look, this isn't my, my thing to do. This isn't what I'm going to do. So I have to leave it to my betters. That is the word that he uses. And so he says he hands it over to the suitors and he goes back to sit down uh, where, where he was sitting beforehand. Now again, Antonus stands up and he tells all of the suitors that the way they're going to do it is they're going to all take their turn, obviously. They're going to start from where there's the steward. There's like a wine steward in the room, right? And he's pouring wine. And he says, we're going to start from there and we're all going to make our way around. I think it's left to right in the book. Yeah, it's definitely left to right. So it's left to right. He says, we're going to go left to right and uh, we're all going to have our own turn in stringing this bow. And everybody's like, Gucci, that's amazing. Let's go. So the first guy stands up to do it. We don't need to know his name because he's not that important, but he stands up and he fails, right? So he tries to string it. Somebody else gets up and tries to string it. And Antonus basically says, this is an impossible task. And what we need is lard. He decides that they need like animal fat and that they're going to melt the animal fat near a fire. And that's how they're going to make the bow a little bit easier to string, which you would think that would probably make it harder. But again, I don't know how to string a bow, but anyways, that's what they say they're gonna do. So Melanthius, who is the goat herder, right? He stands up to get the fire burning and everything like that. He goes to retrieve uh, some, some lard, right? <laughs> he goes to retrieve some animal fat, basically, brings it over to the fire. And the next couple of people who do try, they try with, with the lard on the rope. As all of the suitors are fussing over this though, Odysseus now takes his time to really assess the cowherd and Jumea. So he, he calls them both, obviously he's still in beggar form, calls them both over to where he is and they go outside to have a little chit chat. And he basically says to them, you know, like if Odysseus were to like drop out of the sky right now, would you defend him and would you help defend the palace by attacking all of the suitors? Obviously both men don't even bat an eye and they're just like, oh, yes, he is our king. We love him so much, all of this sort of stuff. That even the cowherd like lifts up a prayer to Zeus and he's like, oh, I wish that Odysseus would drop out of the sky. Can you please let that happen? And Jumaeus then also echoes that which Odysseus is obviously thrilled by this and so he basically looks at them and he just goes great that's really good to know because I am the king which obviously both of them are like what the f you're a beggar what are you talking about so Odysseus then says don't worry I can prove it look at the scar on my leg and so he pulls up his rags and obviously there's like this massive scar in both the cowherd and Eumaeus because everybody seems to know this scar on Odysseus' leg they both just start crying their eyes out right they are emotional messes in this moment. They fling their arms around Odysseus and they're crying and they're kissing his face and he's kissing their hands and it's all like this really cute moment where they're just like, oh, the king is home, thank the Lord. Well, that's a really Christian thing to say. I meant like, thank Zeus. That's a much better one. Ignore the Lord comment. Anywho, Odysseus now says, since you now know my true identity, here is the plan. First and foremost, we're going to go back into the hall, but not together, okay? Because then they will know that we've been conspiring outside. They will think that something is fishy. So we're all gonna go in one by one, okay? We're gonna take our seats as if nothing has happened. I then want to compete in the competition. So he instructs Eumaeus to give him the bow when all of the suitors start to argue because they will argue. So he says, you're going to give me the bow. You're going to hand it over. And as soon as you do, you're then going to go and tell the serving women to go and sit in their quarters. And even if they hear a pin drop, in the hall. They will not come out and they will continue weaving and they will not even question anything, right? That is what you're going to do. Meanwhile, the cow herd, yes, you, you are going to then go outside. You're going to lock the gate because we're going to make sure that everybody is stuck inside. Oh, I forgot to mention that he also says that Eurycleia is going to be instructed to lock the door to the hall so that that way um, nobody can get out via the serving woman part either, right? So the gate is now locked. The door, the other door of the hall now locked. Everybody's going to be locked inside. Odysseus is going to try and string the bow. This is the plan. He's going to try and string the bow. He's probably is going to do it and then he's going to kill everyone. So the cowherd and swineherd, they're just like, amazing plan. Absolutely. Odysseus then walks back into the palace first and the two men then follow. When we get back into the palace, Eurymachus is actually the one who's trying to string the bow, right? And he has been sort of like turning it over in his hands, sort of wrapping all of this lard around the string and all of this. And he can't do it either. And Antonus actually stands up right now and he just says, look, we're probably not doing it because today is Apollo's day. We have to honor him and all of this. So we should really abandon this whole string and the bow thing until tomorrow. We should take time to sacrifice to Apollo because for those of you who don't know, Apollo is the God of archery. So this is actually very appropriate. So he's like, we should really be honoring him today and then we can try again tomorrow. And everybody agrees with this. Everybody's actually just like, you know what? You're probably right. That's probably why none of us can do this, that we're doing this on Apollo's day. He's probably not happy about that. So they all agree to sit down to feast. They pour out a bunch of libations to Apollo. 
they uh, do a bunch of sacrifices and all of this. And once they have been sitting down and they've taken their fill of food and drink, the normal Homeric line, Odysseus in disguise then stands up and he says that he wants to try and string the bow. He says to them, even though all of you have decided that you're not going to compete until tomorrow, I fully respect that, but I would like to try today as just the last try, the last thing to do before the night is over. Obviously though, the suitors don't like this, right? All of the suitors are just like completely outraged and angry that Odysseus in disguise is even suggesting this as a beggar. But Homer does tell us right now that actually the reason why they're so angry is because they secretly fear that he's going to be able to do it. And because of this, Antinous stands up and he decides to speak yet again. This man cannot shut the up. He then has a very long speech where basically the whole general gist of it is that he says, yo, you're a beggar and you have clearly drank far too much. You are clearly way too drunk if you think that you can string that bow if some of the strongest men cannot do it. He then explains this whole myth of the centaurs and the lappets, which is something that you guys will need to know contextually, but it's not that important for the actual story. It is just a very important myth because it is actually depicted on the Parthenon. Interesting. He tells Odysseus in disguise that he can sit and drink as long as he wants to, but that he needs to shut the fuck up, basically. But Penelope is there, right? And Penelope hears this and she is having none of it in her hall. So she stands up, she looks at Antinous and she goes, you are being rude to my guests. She says to all of the suitors, do you really think this beggar is gonna string the bow? I don't even think that he believes he's gonna string the bow. So what harm is it to you if he decides to get up and give it a go? Your attitude, Antinous, is ruining everybody else's fun. Which again, I have to say that I agree with her point too, that like they have to see this guy as a beggar and not as a threat constantly. Even if he does win, like what, what do they think is gonna happen? Eurymachus though, answers that question and the sentiment that he says in his whole speech is that it will be shameful for all of them if a beggar can string this bow and that none of them can do it but it will also be shameful for Penelope if a beggar can string this bow and he rightfully wins her hand in marriage which Penelope has the best retort for in my personal opinion. She turns around to Eurymachus and she really hangs on this word shame and she says shameful? You think that him stringing the bow is what's going to bring shame on you guys? What brings shame on you guys is the fact that you've been here for years eating me out of house and home. And she finishes it by saying that she's not going to marry the beggar. She's like, that's absolutely ridiculous. What I will do though, is I will give him a nice cloak. I will give him nice clothes and I will send him off to wherever it is that he wants to go in the world. Like we're going to treat him like a king if he wins, but I'm not going to marry him. Like don't worry. Now, even though Penelope does have this whole situation under control, like completely under control even, Telemachus wants to stand up because remember he's the man of the house. So he has to exert himself as the man of the house in front of the suitors. So he basically says that because Odysseus is not there, his father is not there, that the bow is now his. So he can technically decide who is to string the bow and who is not to string the bow. And because of this, he then tells Penelope that she should go up to her room and he's gonna finish off this whole thing um, and she's gonna take her handmaidens up there, which Penelope is kind of shocked by because she, again, is a bit like, uh, excuse me, you are my child. But she does understand her place given the society that she is in, so she's very respectful to him and she takes her handmaidens, she goes upstairs, she does a whole crying thing for Odysseus and Athena's like, you can probably go to sleep now. Eumaeus now in this moment takes his opportunity to pick up the bow and to walk it over to Odysseus, but as he's doing this, he gets heckled so much by all of the suitors that he actually starts doubting himself and he kind of like stops as he's walking. And Telemachus from where he is tells Eumaeus that if he doesn't bring the bow over to the beggar in, the, the beggar in disguise, Odysseus in disguise even as a beggar, he says, if you don't continue doing that, then I'm going to pelt you with rocks. Like, again, is this a normal thing to do? And he literally threatens Eumaeus by saying, even though you are older, I am younger and therefore stronger. As in like, I can throw more rocks at you than you think I can, like what? Anyways though, Eumaeus does walk over and he finishes giving the bow to Odysseus in disguise. He also then goes to Eurycleia and gives her the instruction uh, to close, you know, the door to bring all of the women in there, the whole weaving thing. And the cowherd then goes over to the gates. He locks the gates and he puts a stool in front of it so that he can turn around and watch Odysseus as, well, Odysseus in disguise as he does this whole thing. And Eurycleia locks, locks the door, okay? So everybody is now locked inside and Odysseus in disguise is now holding this bow. This is the moment, guys. Odysseus takes a moment to spin the bow around in his hands to really look at it. Part of him is kind of worried that in his absence, sort of worms have gotten into it and he thinks maybe that's why everybody struggled so much. So he's looking at this bow and obviously the suitors can't shut the f up and so they start yelling at him. And they're just like, oh, look at this connoisseur of bows. Bear in mind, we have a description of Eurymachus doing the same thing and no one said that to him, but whatever. This obviously doesn't phase Odysseus and he 
effortlessly strings the bow to the point where Homer actually compares him to somebody who is stringing a lyre, obviously because Homer would have strung a lyre because he was a bard probably. So this is like a real shout out to like, how impressed of a bard that we can do this. And even Odysseus, as he, he finishes stringing the bow, he even plucks the string to like hear the song that it makes, right? And so everybody obviously shook, not only by the sound, but the fact that this beggar has done this. Literally all of the suitors' faces are pale as hell. They are just like, ha what is going on? And right now Zeus sends out this like massive clap of thunder, right? To like tell Odysseus in an omen being like, yeah boo, this is your time. You got this. And so Odysseus pulls back the bow and defies it clean through the 12 axes. And as a reader, you guys, as a reader, you're just sitting there and you're like, hell yes, you do your thing Odysseus. Because this is a very unviolent moment, right? In a hot second, there's going to be obviously like a lot of blood, but like right now, this is very much just Odysseus asserting his own power and asserting, you know, his his rightly part as king, right? So this is like a real moment for you as a reader, like when you're actually going through the scene and you're just like, look at him display his talent. Look at him display his Odysseusness. And after he's done this, he turns around to Telemachus and he says, your guest has not disgraced you, which is a lovely end to the book because then Telemachus walks over and he stands next to Odysseus and we are about to kill all of the suitors and I'm effing ready for it. Okay, so that is the end of the book. It was definitely ended on like such a high note of like, we're about to get into the action that we've all been waiting for. And it was just such, oh, I love it when he strings the bow. Like that for me, even once again, as you guys read that, the way that Homer writes that is just such a like momentous time. And as you're reading, you're just like, Yes, it's so exciting. Like, honestly, I can't even tell you. So thank you guys so much for tuning into book 21 of Homer's Odyssey. And we'll be seeing you next time for book 22. When finally all of the suitors will die. Thank God. So we'll see you then.